Donc, euh, bienvenue euh, à tous et à toutes euh, à ce premier événement organisé dans le cadre de l'exposition Pierre-Luigi Nervi, maître concepteur bâtisseur, présenté au Centre de design jusqu'au 7 février prochain. Euh, le professeur Jean Legault, euh, commissaire avec moi sur l'exposition, on a le plaisir de vous accueillir ce soir euh, en présence et en virtuel euh, pour la conférence du professeur Thomas Leslie. Euh, quelques petits mots euh, pour le, ceux qui sont en ligne. Je vous rappelle que cette conférence est enregistrée et sera disponible en rediffusion sur le site Internet du Centre de design. Merci de maintenir en permanence votre micro éteint ainsi que la caméra fermée si vous ne souhaitez pas être visible sur l'enregistrement. Si ce n'est pas déjà fait, activez l'affichage intervenant de Zoom pour laisser toute la place à nos invités. La conférence sera présentée en anglais, euh, mais à la fin de la conférence, euh, on aura une période de questions pour traduire les questions et les réponses. Euh, et si vous souhaitez, pendant la conférence, poser vos, euh, vos questions aussi, n'hésitez pas à envoyer vos questions en utilisant la fonction « Converser » de Zoom. Euh, maintenant, pour euh, présenter notre invité, euh, Moral Professor d'architecture à Iowa State University, le professeur Thomas Leslie enseigne dans les champs reliés à la conception, la technologie du bâtiment et l'histoire de l'architecture et de la construction. Ses intérêts portent sur l'interaction et l'intégration de la science du bâtiment, de la fonction et de l'esthétique dans la conception d'édifices. Ses recherches portent sur des exemples historiques de cette intégration, en particulier le travail de l'architecte Louis Kahn avec son livre « Louis Kahn, Building Art, Building Science » publié en 2005. Les premiers gratte-ciels de Chicago avec le livre « Chicago Skyscrapers, 1871-1934 publié en 2013, et le travail de l'ingénieur constructeur italien Pierre Luigi Nervi, avec le livre « Beauty's Rigor, Patterns of Production in the Work of Pierre Luigi Nervi » publié en 2017. Avant son travail en tant que professeur à l'Iowa State University, Thomas Leslie était associé chez Foster and Partners à Londres. I feel very privileged to have him present tonight, and I thank him and welcome him virtually to the School of Design. Thomas? Well, thank you very much, uh, Carlo. It's a great honor to uh, address you all tonight. And a great pleasure to talk about uh, Nervi's work. I, I only wish that we could be there, I could be there in person. Uh, I know that the exhibit uh, is a, a, a truly great one. Uh, I've seen some pieces of it uh, before, and uh, I, I envy your ability to, uh, to hear about Nervi's work and then to, to go out and, and see the, the exhibit itself. It, um, it is, it is uh, truly a, a, a special thing. Um, let me uh, pull my slides up here. Um, <clears throat> So my uh, interest in Nervi's work uh, stems from my uh, background uh, in, in practice uh, with Foster's. Nervi, of course, was one of the great heroes of the office. And we thought of him uh, not only as a structural engineer, but as a structural designer, someone who took a, a great interest in the formal and aesthetic implications uh, of, of the, the structures that he designed. And I think this is very much the way that Nervi gets written up in history as this kind of poet in concrete. That's the way that uh, most uh, commentators have, have described him. And they ascribe to him this sort of uh, sense, sensibility of the, the potential beauty in structures and, and talk about him uh, as an artist uh, in this material that is, is so important to the, to the 20th century. And in my own research, I wanted to find out where that came from, whether this was just strictly a work of, of genius that we might not uh, ever ever replicate, or whether there were other factors at work that made Nervi uh, particularly uh, uh, insightful about the aesthetic potential of, of concrete. And what I found in the, the sort of theme of the, of the book is that uh, Nervi really had two careers, and it was blending these two careers that made him such a successful 
uh, uh, engineer, such a successful designer, entrepreneur, but also that, that was the basis really for the aesthetic value uh, in his work, that, that melding these two uh, was really the, the key to his success. Nervi was a practicing engineer, uh, uh, what we would think of as a sort of white collar necktie engineer. This is his office on the left, uh, on the Lungo Tevere, north of, of Rome's city center. But he was also a contractor. He was also a builder who was responsible for figuring out how to construct the things that he designed. And the second career took place uh, at his job, uh, job site uh, yard in southern Rome in Maliana. And on the right, you see an experimental shed that he built uh, in 1946 out of a material that, that I'll talk about here in a minute. And it was this going back and forth between the intellectual activity of, desi of designing structures and the very hands-on activity of building structures that Nervi was able to weave together into something that became much more than just simply design or simply construction that became really something more uh, artistic. And Nervi's career from its very beginning was one that, that, that forged links between these two worlds of the, the pure design on the one hand and, and construction on the other. When he was a student uh, at university in Bologna, he had two professors that he spoke about often as the largest influences in his career. Uh, Silvio Canavazzi, who is on the left, was a theorist, a mathematician, who developed some of the very early theories about uh, hyperstatic structures, structures in which we can't really be sure exactly how the, the forces within them flow, but using very uh, advanced mathematics, we can take increasingly precise uh, sort of guesses at that. Uh, Canavazzi wasn't a builder, he was a, a mathematician, uh, very much a sort of white collar a professor, a lecturer. Uh, but Nervi also took courses from Attilio Muggia, who you see on the right. And Muggia was what today we would call a professor of practice. He had a contracting firm that built factories uh, throughout uh, the, the region, sort of central, north central uh, Italy, uh, and especially in Prado, one of the big textile uh, centers of, of Italy. Uh, Muggia was not a theorist. He was very hands-on. He was definitely a builder. And importantly, when Nervi graduated uh, from university, he went to work for Muggia. Muggia recognized uh, his talent and took him on as as what today we would call a, a project manager. Now, what's interesting about the work that Nervi did in this era is just how pedestrian, how plain uh, it is. Muggia was uh, an expert in reinforced concrete, but he was not a form giver. He was essentially a problem solver. And Nervi uh, was responsible for uh, more than a dozen structures uh, throughout Prato especially that as you can see from these images, uh, were very nondescript, very simple, very plain concrete factories. Um, but he gained a great deal of experience uh, on the job site in how concrete came together uh, in what its potential was. And even if he couldn't maybe build the expressive forms that every young builder engineer maybe is interested in, uh, he gained this very valuable sort of hands-on uh, experience. Now, as Nervi was coming of age as a builder and as an engineer, uh, Italy was in a particularly precarious situation uh, politically. When the fascists came to power, and particularly when Mussolini invaded Ethiopia uh, in the late 1920s, uh, Italy became an international pariah, and it was impossible to trade with other countries uh, for, for goods or for, or for materials. And engineers and builders in particular faced a very, very limited palette uh, of construction materials that they could use. Um, these two maps here show the, the distribution of, on the left, iron ore uh, in Europe, and on the right, coal. These are the, the two necessary ingredients for steel production. And you can see that Italy has neither of them. Uh, there is no naturally occurring iron ore on the Italian peninsula, uh, and there is very, very little coal to be had. So when Italy was shut off from the rest of the world, its architects and its builders uh, really had to think about other ways to build. But if you look at Northern Europe, you can see that the, what we think of as the iron belt where uh, all of the great advances in steel technology and, and building occurred are all in Germany and Eastern France uh, and in England. Uh, Italy and uh, uh, Spain and other uh, countries in Southern Europe uh, specialized more in concrete. And Italy, because it couldn't access uh, uh, materials to make steel uh, really specialized uh, in, in concrete. 
Now, the fascists had ideas about what a, a so-called autarkic or uh, independent autonomous architecture for Italy would be. And, and Mussolini in particular thought that its architects and builders should go back to Roman times, right? Build again with brick uh, and with travertine. Uh, but Nervi had other uh, visions. And in a very, very brave editorial that he wrote in 1938, he made the argument that concrete, because it's, it can be such an efficient structural material, would in the long run actually save on the scarce resources uh, that Italy had to build with. And he argued for this based on the fact that um, brick and, and travertine, not only, well, brick required a great deal of fuel to, uh, to fire it. So either coal, which was hard to get, or timber, which was becoming increasingly scarce as Italy sort of finished off the, the forests that uh, the Romans had, had begun uh, cutting down uh, 2000 years earlier. And Nervi said, look, if, if you really want to build in the most efficient, most autonomous, independent way possible, you'd use concrete and you would use reinforced concrete. Rebar, uh, reinforcing steel was difficult to come by, but not impossible. And in the very, very small quantities that it uh, was used in for reinforcing concrete, uh, it proved, Nervi thought, to be more economical to use the steel in conjunction with concrete uh, to, to build the structures that the, the, the country needed in these times of, of sort of dire uh, economy uh, and being shut off uh, from the rest of the world. When Nervi went out on his own, uh, he worked at first with a, a cousin of his who was also a builder. Uh, and he really, in his very early career, uh, made the argument for concrete as a, a material that was not only potentially native uh, to Italy, but also could be expressive of all of the kind of dynamism and, and all of the, the sort of nationalism that, uh, that the fascist regime wanted. This stadium in Florence really shows Nervi treading a very, very careful line. Uh, on the left, this was the first uh, of the grandstands that was built in 1930. Uh, after this uh, was built and after it gained a lot of a very positive press, not only from the, the internal uh, fascist architectural press in Italy who appreciated its uh, dynamism, its, its long curving uh, roofs, which suggested to many the kind of forward march of, of progress. Uh, it also put Nervi's name internationally uh, on the map. This was covered in, in other countries as well. Um, after 1930, the team built another stand on the other side of the field. Uh, Nervi switched business partners. Uh, he and Nebiosi split, uh, and he joined instead uh, with Bartoli, who became uh, his sort of lifelong partner uh, in, in contracting. And Bartoli, I think, uh, gave Nervi the confidence to experiment with the potential for very expressive, but also very efficient structural form. On the right, you see these famous staircases that for Nervi solved a circulation problem. Uh, instead of bringing people in from the front of the stands, like you see in the, the old stand on the left, um, he brought people in from the back so that they would naturally fill up from the front uh, towards the back as, as people arrived. And to do this, uh, he had to have a stair that would sort of go out and, and come back, right? Return basically to the same plan space uh, that, that people took off from. You could do this with a very simple scissor stair. Nervi beginning to get a sense for the expressive potential of concrete, instead designs this helical staircase that as you can see is balanced by a, a helical support going the other direction. Uh, impossible at the time to fully calculate. Nervi designed this basically intuitively figuring that the, the weight and the, the torsion in the stair would be best balanced by a, a simple structural element that just went the other way, right? That was the sort of mirror image uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the stair itself. Uh, this stadium, I should add, has is, is served uh, Florence's soccer team, Fiorentina, uh, ever since. Uh, it was threatened with demolition last year. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that an international uh, campaign led by the Nervi Foundation has, at least for the moment, uh, save the stadium, and it, it's the result of an, or it's the subject of an international competition uh, to try to reimagine how it uh, could continue to serve uh, Fiorentina for another, hope we hope, uh, 80 years. Uh, very soon, uh, of course, Italy was uh, at war uh, and allied with the Axis powers uh, and cut off in a very, very real way from the from the rest of the country. And Nervi uh, worked for the Italian military. Uh, in particular, he answered a call in 
uh, the er very, very early part of the, of the, the buildup to the war uh, for aircraft hangars for the Italian Air Force. Um, the Italian Air Force was largely composed of uh, very fragile biplanes from the uh, teens and 20s. They, of course, did not have the aluminum or the, or the metal that it took to build advanced fighters. Uh, and so they were stuck basically with these very fragile uh, aircraft. And the Air Force needed uh, hangars to protect these fragile aircraft from the, from the elements, but they didn't have any of the steel that other countries were using uh, to, to build these facilities. And they were beginning to run short of timber, which would have been the other structural option. So Nervi proposed building uh, hangars out of concrete and very lightly reinforced concrete he, uh, he proposed at first. And you can see in this first round of hangars that uh, he begins to look at ways to kind of uh, put structural ideas together in ways that will increase the efficiency of, of the basic uh, premise. So if you look at the, the axon on the right, these hangars are basically long concrete shells uh, that act as doubly curved surfaces. So they act a little bit as roofs, they act a little bit as beams. If you look at the interior on the left, this is a, a very uh, standard structural pattern called a lamella. So the diamond shapes are really intersecting uh, semicircular ribs that stiffen one another and it's stiff in a very, very thin shell of, of concrete above. And you can look at these types of structures either as these very thin shells that are stiffened with the network of diagonal ribs, or you can think of it as a very, very thick concrete shell uh, with a lot of the dead weight actually scooped out of it, right? So coffering, very similar to the way that the, the Pantheon in Rome, for example, uh, was built a couple thousand years ago, tricking the structure basically into thinking or behaving like a very, very deep, thick uh, shell, but actually scooping out uh, most of the weight uh, underneath it. And you can see that Nervi uh, props the, the roof up and where the planes need to go in and out, the hangar doors on the right, uh, he has this very, very uh, long triangular truss that takes the, the thrust of the shell, its tendency to flatten out uh, and basically acts like a horizontal beam, right? resisting that, uh, that horizontal thrust. Uh, these hangars uh, were successful. They were built uh, on schedule, on budget, uh, and they were published again, not only in Italy, uh, but also in the international press. Uh, and they were hailed as a, a great success, an incredibly lightweight uh, concrete structure for the era, for 1937. Uh, but Nervi was very self-critical and uh, later on, he would write that as the hangars were being built, uh, he looked at the job site and said and realized, he said he realized that uh, what they were doing was building two buildings. They were first building a timber structure, all of the formwork to make the, the lamellar uh, pattern. They were discarding all of that timber, which remember was almost as precious as any of the metal or, or coal that the, the country could get in, discarding all of the formwork. Uh, and then uh, after the, the concrete cured, then the concrete structure uh, was the second building, essentially, that, that they were constructing. And Nervi was troubled by this. He was also troubled by the weight of all of that uh, concrete. The lamella pattern certainly saved a great deal of concrete, uh, but it remained heavy. And to Nervi's mind, the detail on the right, where all of this rebar comes together to transfer the, the, the weight of the shell down into those buttresses that, that lined the perimeter. Uh, Nervi said later that he thought that this ended up being almost a, a steel building uh, covered in concrete. He, of course, kept very quiet about this, didn't tell the, the Air Force uh, that he thought that, but he was self-critical and understood that uh, this was only a, a partial solution uh, to the problem of such resource uh, scarcity uh, in, in Italy. So he goes back to his job site, uh, his job yard in Maliana, and he begins to experiment with the idea of prefabrication. He realizes that you could take the same lamellar pattern uh, and you could uh, prefabricate all of the truss elements. And in doing so, you could get a much tighter geometry. You could afford using a jig or a mold to use a very small amount of timber. You could use that timber to make elements that uh, had the, 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 the material scooped out from around the neutral axis, the, the center of the the, um, the, the ribs where the 
material is doing the least work in bending. Uh, and you could save, he thought, about 60 or 70 percent of the weight of those ribs by using this prefabricated uh, system. Here you see an early uh, test that he did in his, in his job site yard. You can see uh, EUR off to the right if you, if you know Rome. And then in what I think was one of the most important realizations in his career, he understood, I think this sketch shows him figuring out how you could take each of those prefabricated elements and essentially glue them together. In the upper left, the kind of smeared pencil sketch that you see shows loops of rebar sticking out of the ends of these uh, prefabricated elements. And the octagon, the sort of stop sign shape, is a plug of poured concrete that basically binds all of those elements of, of reinforcing together. And when you do that hundreds of times throughout the, the structure, uh, what you end up with is a prefabricated uh, system uh, made up of elements that can be fabricated offsite or adjacent to the site uh, with all of the monolithic uh, qualities of a fully reinforced, a fully poured concrete structure. Most importantly, you could build this on simple centering. Uh, instead of pouring it into formwork. And you could reuse this centering again and again, so you wouldn't be wasting uh, all of the timber, or as he would come to realize, all of the metal, right? You could borrow enough metal to build a centering. Uh, you could lay out all of the, the uh, prefabricated truss work, glue them together with these little concrete plugs. And here between the truss elements, you can see the, the kind of raw uh, rebar sticking out, waiting to be glued into place uh, by this concrete. And you could even divide the, the structure into smaller pieces and reuse that centering uh, again and again. Importantly, Nervi also realized that by saving all of this weight, you would reduce your reliance on heavy equipment. His contracting firm was relatively small. It was what we would think of today as a sort of family run, almost artisanal contracting firm. He had to rent all of the lifting material that, that he brought to the site. And very early on, what he realized was that the smaller uh, the pieces that you were trying to lift, or think of it another way, the more you were able to break down a large structure into small prefabricated elements, the lighter the crane you would need to rent. And you could save money on the crane rental by breaking your structure down into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, this to me is one of the great examples of that. This is a viaduct that uh, Nerevi designed and built uh, for the 1960 Olympics in Rome. We'll come back to this uh, site uh, in a little bit. But in addition to saving money on cranes, I think Nervi also realized that this imparted a very natural kind of human grain to the, to the structure, that instead of just uh, pouring a, a giant uh, shell of concrete that had no scale, breaking it down into these economical prefabricated elements imparted to the building a kind of natural grain, a human scale, or at least a more human scale, uh, because of the, the smaller size of the, of the lifting equipment that he was using. And so when he gets a, a, a second commission for more uh, aircraft hangars, uh, these at Orbitello and Torre del Lago, uh, he borrows basically the same form, the lamellar uh, stiffened shell. But as you can see on the left, and that is uh, Nervi in the very dapper uh, jacket and tie on, on the left there, um, you can see that there's a very, very small traveling scaffold uh, that is made out of reusable metal pieces. You can also see that he's prefabricating these pieces and cutting out sort of 50 or 60% uh, of the weight and using just very small cranes to lift them into place, eliminating all of the expensive uh, timber formwork and saving so much weight that he can now bring the, the, the roof loads down onto eight discrete buttresses instead of the 30 or 40 that lined the perimeter of the, the original ones. The other really interesting thing that happens here is that for the first time, Nervi commissions Studio Vasari, an architectural photography firm in Rome, to come out to the site as the hangars are being finished to document them. He's never done this before. All of the photography of the earlier hangars was done just by people on the job site. And I think what Nervi realized here is that even though what he was aiming for was an incredibly efficient structure, an incredibly efficient construction process, uh, what he ended up achieving was something architectural, right? Something genuinely beautiful that deserved to be photographed, not just by a job site photographer, but by someone with a more artistic eye, right? That the, the, the efficiency and the, the, um, the, the logic of the construction is so clear that suddenly he's almost sort of stumbled into to architecture. <laughs> 
The other experiment that um, he's commissioned to do by the Italian military uh, comes later in the war when the Italian Navy is sort of desperate to find other materials besides steel from which to build their ships. And Nervi is commissioned to design and build a series of concrete uh, vessels. And to do this, of course, he has to save weight. So he relies on an old French technique called ferro cemento to build these four ship hulls that uh, are commissioned in 1943. The process involves taking a very, very minimal amount of rebar, forming the doubly curved hull of the ship, and then using a very, very fine metal mesh laid over the rebar as a matrix for a, a lightweight uh, cement that gets applied to it. So what you end up with uh, are these layers of mesh that are impregnated with lightweight concrete. It has some qualities of uh, a metal hull. It's ductile, it's, it's very strong uh, and very thin, and some qualities of a concrete uh, form, right? It's very, very tough, very, very rigid. And as you can see on the right, easy to build. Nervi's given a shipyard with no lifting equipment and with no electricity. And his labor force is entirely unskilled, just people who uh, are unemployed and, and can't find work elsewhere. You see on the right that they're just troweling the cement into the, the, uh, the, the metal matrix. And what this gives you is a, a very, very cheap, very, very efficient, very, very thin uh, concrete form. And Nervi realized as he was building these that this could have architectural implications. Uh, here are the same lecture series that he talked about prefabrication. He says you can take those prefabricated elements. If you make them out of Pharaoh's cement, you suddenly take them from a, a minimum of three inches thick down to something more like an inch and a half. So you can have the amount of weight that each of these elements have as well. Uh, here on the right, uh, you see uh, Pharaoh's cement prefabricated roof elements being hoisted into place on the Stadio Flaminio, uh, one of the Olympic stadiums uh, in Rome. So Nervi has these ideas about prefabrication, eliminating uh, formwork. He has this technique of ferro cement. And very soon after the war, he gets a commission where he's able to put these together uh, in a work of architecture. Uh, the city of Turin had been heavily bombed uh, during the war. It's always been uh, Italy's automotive center. It's where Fiat is located. Uh, and after, the, after 1945, the city decides that it's going to host the International Exposition of Automobile Design uh, in 1949. And they have uh, roughly 18 months to build a brand new exhibition hall. Uh, they send out a, a tender, a call for tenders uh, to the, the country's contractors. And Nervi is the only one who even responds. He's the only one who thinks that he can actually build this exposition hall in 18 months. And what he decides to do is to take the exact same technique that he used to build these prototype ship hulls and combine them with the, the prefabrication that has, has allowed him to build the hangars. So he's going to get a team of uh, uh, unskilled laborers together. These uh, folks will take metal mesh, they'll bend it over clay molds, and they will basically build these little boats out of ferro cement hundreds of them over and over and over again. And these will be the building blocks for the roof of the, the exposition center. Uh, here on the left, a different project, but you see this sort of technique. And on the right, the only image I've ever seen of the actual fabrication yard, where while the foundations are being dug for the, for the hall, uh, a crew of workers is just building uh, form after form, little boat after little boat uh, out of ferro cement. When the, the uh, substructure has risen to the point where they can start the roof, Nervi builds a traveling uh, scaffold. You can see it on the right, very, very lightweight uh, metal on wheels. So it can be demounted and moved. It's basically sort of extruding the, uh, the, the hull as he goes. And on the left, you can see that there is no crane, that each one of these elements is small enough that it can be hoisted using a simple winch uh, by four uh, workmen. They lift each one of these little ferro cement boats up. They set it on a, a, a rail that's uh, designed to the curvature of the roof. They slide it down and they grout one of these, uh, they grout them uh, to one another uh, as they go. You can see that it's a, a waved form. So it's a, a little bit of a folded plate. It's a little bit of a beam arch. It's prefabricated. It's out of ferro cement. All of these efficiencies not only allow Nervi to build the building within 18 months, uh, 
Uh, but when it opens, it is a sensation. And the architectural press comes, and many of them write about this great architect, Pierluigi Nervi. Nervi's qualified as an engineer. He's qualified as a contractor. He has never taken an architectural course in his life, right? This is architecture that comes just out of the logic of the structure and the logic of the, of the fabrication. So here you see that first show. And way at the back, you see a, a very, very interesting semicircular dome that the, uh, the, the clients insisted on as the kind of apps or the, the honorific uh, place where they could give the, the big annual uh, automotive design awards. Nervi tried to talk them out of it. He said a half dome isn't really a structural shape. Uh, it'll try to flatten out. The only way to do it is to build a great big collar around the base to restrain the, the bottom of the dome and then to save as much weight uh, as you possibly can. And this idea that you have to build a very, very light dome makes him think about applying the technique of ferro cement to the lamellar geometry that he used in the, in the two hangers. So building these now triangular and diamond shaped pans, almost like kind of uh, hats with little brims uh, on the base, uh, arraying them around the surface of the half dome, filling in the backside with concrete so that what you're left with are essentially the, the coffers and ribs uh, that he was exploring, that he was using in the, in the hangers themselves. But now instead of extruded, they are rotated, right? They're wrapped around a, a polar uh, coordinate. So this is successful. The, the dome works. He's able to build it using this technique. And yet again, there is this incredible kind of architectural effect, right? Like a spider web of concrete uh, over the, the honorific uh, part of the exposition hall. Now, maybe more famously, Nervi uh, uses this uh, technique of, of making formwork out of ferro cement pans uh, to build this famous isostatic slab for a, a, a wool warehouse outside of Rome, right? He's able to shape the ribs of a typical waffle slab to more accurately reflect the way that the structural forces are, are moving through it. Um, but he also uses this technique of pans to build bigger and bigger uh, domes. And in 1957, when the International Olympic Committee is considering Rome for the, as the site for the 1960 Olympics, uh, Nervi gets a commission for a prototype arena that he's going to use this technique to build not just a half dome, but now a, a full dome. And the Palazzetto dello Sport in Rome, you can see on the left, built largely by hands labor. Uh, Italy has a surplus of unskilled labor in the 1950s. And this is the same technique, the same basic idea as the, the hall in Turin, that you have a crew of laborers who just build diamond-shaped pan after diamond-shaped pan. They have a, a handful, something like 16 different molds, uh, depending on where the, the pan's gonna go in the dome. They just build these over and over again while the foundations are being uh, dug and, and poured for the, for, the, uh, for the hall itself. On the right, you see them being put into place. You can see that the gaps between the pans where the little brims on the bottom meet each other, those will form the ribs of the dome. The crane in the middle is a very lightweight crane. It only has to pick up these light pans and it was only on site uh, for 30 days. They were able to lay all of the pans uh, within a month. After the concrete is poured on the back, what you get on the underside is again, this incredibly uh, delicate appearing uh, web of, of concrete supported, as you see on the left, by this ring of forked uh, buttresses that are taking both the, the thrust of the dome, its tendency to spread out, uh, but also lifting the weight of the dome uh, up above the concourse. Um, it's called by the architectural press uh, a pantheon in concrete. Nervi points out that you know not only was the pantheon actually in concrete, but there are two different things that, that, that Nervi is doing here that, that to show how far concrete has come in 2000 years. One, he says that you know, the, the, the Pantheon Dome is in some places 15 or 20 feet thick down at the base. He says here that the, the dome is only three inches thick, right? And proportionally, if you don't count the ribs, it's even thinner than an eggshell, right? He says, we've finally kind of matched nature in, in the way we can design shells. But the more impressive thing Nervi says is that, look, you know, the Pantheon has this famous oculus at the top, right? Light comes in from the top. Here, light comes in actually from underneath the dome, right? So the dome is supported. And what you see is it literally floating above sunlight, right? On a bright, sunny day, 
the glare from the, uh, from the windows makes it appear as if the dome is, is literally uh, floating. There's also, there's another kind of final uh, clever piece of, of construction sequencing. While they poured the, the foundation around the outside, they left the excavation and pouring of the seat bowl until the dome was complete. So they could come in and, and scoop that all out and pour the seating bowl without having to worry about the weather, right? Any rain would be kept off by the, by the finished dome. Um, the project is successful. The Olympic Committee says, well, if, if the, uh, uh, the local Italian committee uh, can build a building like this, of course they can have the, the Olympics. And Nervi gets several of the commissions uh, for the large uh, uh, arenas, stadiums, and, and as I showed earlier, the viaduct uh, that, that helped the, um, the Olympics work, right? A, a successful Olympics that took place uh, all over the, the city of Rome. And while the Palazzetto was maybe more famous, um, probably the, the more impressive structure was the Palazzo della Sport, the large palace uh, of sport, where Nervi having to, to uh, span a, an even greater distance than the Palazzetto uh, returns to the same technique that uh, he used for the, the Turin Hall. This is one of these folded plates, but now instead of on an extruded a plan, it's on a rotated plan. And Nervi later says this isn't quite ideal. You have to scaffold the entire structure instead of having a, a traveling uh, scaffold. But it's an incredibly impressive space. Uh, the, the Palazzetto is the dome that beats the Pantheon for the longest span a concrete dome. It holds that record for three years, and then the Palazzo uh, beats it using the, the, the technique of these ferrocement pans. Um, Nervi throws everything he knows into this building. So on the underside of the seats on the right, you see that he can't resist himself. He's going to put the ferro-cement diamond pans that formed the structure for the Palazzetto into the building somewhere. Uh, here they go on the underside of the, of the curved uh, seats. The 1960 Olympics are the first ones to be televised internationally. And so as People all over the world are, in this case, watching a, a young Cassius Clay, uh, later Muhammad Ali, win his gold medal in boxing. They are seeing Nervi's structures behind all of the action. And this gives Nervi uh, status as a, as a celebrity engineer. Uh, there's an article about him in The New Yorker. There's one in Time. The New York Times, uh, Ada Louise Huxtable writes a long piece on the poet in concrete who has given the Rome games such an elegant sort of futuristic uh, set of structures. And the buildings themselves go on to have celebrity status as well. One of the things that I find really extraordinary is where the Palazzo della Sport shows up in Italian culture uh, in the 1960s. On the left, you can see a, a photo shoot in Vogue on Italian fashion, where they actually staged it in the concourses of the Palazzo, right? This is the most Italian thing ever in the 1960s, something that is so high tech and, and so refined in terms of design. And his buildings also become a real statement about uh, Italy's society and culture in, in the post-war era and the so-called uh, Italian miracle uh, years. Uh, on the right, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's La Clis, uh, starring Monica Vitti, where the Palazzo actually has almost like a, a, a role as a bit player. She goes on these long existential walks, uh, always with the Palazzo behind it. Nervi's buildings show up in uh, movies not only by Antonioni, but also by uh, Federico Fellini, where again, the Palazzo plays this uh, sort of uh, uncanny role, uh, almost as a character in the film. None of this is intentional on Nervi's part. He hasn't wanted to create these great statements, uh, architectural statements about Italian culture. These have all come from a very, very refined approach uh, to not only designing the structures, but also designing uh, the fabrication and, and the construction. But they create these structures that are incredibly compelling, right? incredibly beautiful. And Nervi's very late career uh, after the Olympics uh, is really as a, a celebrity engineer and a, and a consulting engineer. Um, he works on almost every continent, uh, Australia on the left, uh, North America, the St. Mary's Cathedral in, in San Francisco in the middle, uh, and the, the Dartmouth Ice Arena on the right, also in South, uh, South America. Uh, and of course, the project that will be most familiar to you is the Tour de la Bourse uh, in Montreal, which is an all Italian project in its design phases. He is paired with the Italian architect Luigi Moretti uh, to design what is first this uh, triple tower uh, that is gradually cut back as the, uh, the uh, economy 
uh, collapses in the in the mid 1960s to just a, a single tower. And there's kind of a, a um, almost a, a slightly sad tale about it uh, that Moretti, who was never designed a skyscraper, looks to uh, Nervi's work on the Pirelli Tower in Milan, which he designed with Gio Ponti in the early 1950s. Um, and as there, as Nervi is coming up with what we would today call an outrigger structure, uh, a core that uh, uses trusses to connect with these piers on the on the four corners that uh, not only take the gravity loads but also stabilize it against the wind. Um, Moretti is designing the interior of the building as if it were the the Pirelli Tower. And unfortunately, the Pirelli Tower was designed for a single corporation and had. Uh, very, very low elevator uh, provisions. And almost at the last minute in the design, they do a check and the client realizes there aren't enough elevators. The building suddenly has to bulk up uh, and it, it becomes a, a slightly less elegant uh, tower than, uh, than Moretti and, and Nervi had, had initially imagined. But it's a very important structure for Nervi. It comes between the, the Pirelli Tower on the left and Australia Square, <clears throat> the, the tower that he does with Harry Seidler in Sydney uh, on the right. And it is, as far as I can tell, the first uh, outrigger structure to rely on what we today call a, a braced core. This is the, the system that um, braces, for example, the Burj Khalifa right now, the, the tallest building uh, in the world in Dubai, where you have a, a, a core that does most of the work and then to handle the wind loads, it has the, the leverage of these uh, outrigger uh, structures uh, on either side. The Montreal Tower is one that I think is underrated uh, and by uh, uh, um, uh, people who studied Nervi's work. I think it's this important link in his own career uh, as he develops ideas about skyscrapers, but it was also phenomenally influential uh, to structural engineers. It was the tallest reinforced concrete tower uh, when it opened in 1966. So just to conclude, I, I, I want to talk about just for a moment about how this happens, right? How someone who has no aesthetic training uh, ends up designing these works that uh, film directors and, and fashion editors uh, and, and uh, really the whole world find compelling and find to be really cogent statements about the, the state of architecture and the state of kind of science and technology in the, in the 1960s, right? In the early uh, space age. Um, Nervi uh, was asked to give the Norton Lectures in Poetry at Harvard in 1961, and he turned his lectures into a book, Aesthetics and Technology and Building, a, a few years later. And in it, he grapples with, you know, how this happens, right? How a, a, an engineer and a builder ends up designing things that become known for their architectural qualities. And he has this uh, definition or this kind of philosophy that I think rings true to anyone who has struggled with issues of, of structure and construction uh, in their design work. He says that the relationship between technology and aesthetics, obviously the, the subject of the whole lecture series, relies on the designer understanding the, the, what's, based, what's given to him, right? The, the objective data of the problem, technology and statics. He says those suggest the forms, right? Uh, they, they, they give the designer kind of a library of possibilities, but the designer is still in charge. And it's the designer who has to mold those suggestions, punctuate those suggestions, detail or ornament those suggestions in ways that uh, make a, a, a more coherent uh, story. And crucially for Nervi, um, there are two components, two realms that offer uh, these suggestions to the designer. Statics, which we think about often when we think about Nervi, right? These are clearly structurally expressive works, but also what Nervi called technology. And I, I think that he was struggling here to come up with a word for fabrication, for building, for the, for the technology of the, of the job site. When these two realms uh, are butted up against each other, there's often a negotiation between the most efficient structure versus the most efficient process. And Nervi understands that the designer has to be the sort of orchestrator of those and to be fluent in both realms so that you can come up with the, the most efficient balance between the two, but also to be aware of the aesthetic uh, possibilities there. And I think that is a, a lesson that is uh, frankly timeless, right? Something that, that we still uh, work with today. So to conclude, I, I would um, just th throw uh, the, the two uh, books that came out of this project. 
uh, the, the book that I did, Beauty's Rigor, which came out in 2017, and then a reprint of Aesthetics and Technology and Building, a, a critical edition uh, with new introductions and, and other essays, including by Cristiana Chiarino, uh, the sort of one of the uh, major masterminds behind the exhibition you have there today, uh, and Elisabetta Nervi, who is the, the, the president of the Pierluigi Nervi uh, Foundation and who has spearheaded uh, much of the, the recent preservation uh, campaign for his work. And just to say that the, the Stadio Flaminio and the Turin Hall have both been the recipients of uh, grants from the Getty Foundation to try to uh, work up restoration and rehabilitation plans uh, for them both. They're both uh, going ahead, I'm happy to say, and, and we are hoping that like the Florence Stadium, uh, we have these buildings uh, around for another uh, 70 or 80 years at least. Um, I, I will close it there with this image of uh, Nervi at work. This is him, of course, in his uh, professional office, white collar, suit jacket, uh, drawing away with that Studio Vasari image of the hanger uh, on the wall to his left. And I look at this image and I think there's a part of him that probably can't wait uh, to get down to Maliana in the afternoon uh, and experiment with some of the ideas that, that he's drawing up on his desk there. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it there. And, and Carlo, I hope we've left enough time for, for questions today. Can you hear me, Thomas? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Uh, so thank you very much. The lecture was beautiful and I would invite my students maybe to give you a nice uh, um, applause. Um, we'll open to the floor to some questions. Uh, any questions? Yes. 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 Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Thomas? Yes, I have a question. Uh, what do we know about the relationship between Nervi and the architects he worked with? For example, uh, Vitellozzi for the Falazzetto or Gioponti for the, the, the um, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the Pirelli Tower. The Pirelli Tower, yes, sorry. And then uh, in Montreal with uh, Moretti. So do we know anything mm. about this relationship? Thank you. Uh, Yes, thank you, uh, quite a bit. Uh, Carla, do you want to repeat that uh, in French or do you want me to go ahead and, and answer straight away? Thank you for reminding me, Thomas. Okay. <laughs> Donc, les gens, est-ce que tu veux poser la question en français? Non, mais la question simplement, c'est est-ce qu'on sait, qu'est-ce qu'on sait de la relation entre Nervi et les architectes avec lesquels il a travaillé? <laughs> Donc, uh, Vitello aussi pour le Palazzetto de, de lo Sport, um, Gioponti pour la tour Pirelli et uh, uh, Moretti pour la tour La Place Victoria. So what is the, what kind of relationship did he have with architects? Right, um, it, 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 it varied. Uh, he um, had a, a, a fairly, ten, the correspondence on the Montreal project shows that he had a fairly tense relationship with Moretti that Moretti wanted to, to do things architecturally that Nervi often felt compromised the, the structure. Um, on Pirelli, he had a surprisingly good relationship with Gio Ponti, who, if you've ever read uh, Ponti's writing, seems like this very uh, cerebral, uh, you know, not grounded at all in reality. But, but Nervi seemed to find common ground uh, with him in, in the way that the, the forms worked. The most interesting relationship, though, was with Harry Seidler in, uh, in Australia. Uh, Seidler wrote to Nervi about Australia Square, uh, asking him for um, advice. Uh, and they had a correspondence for several years on that project and others that was incredibly uh, warm and re respectful. And at the end, Seidler said, you've given me all this advice, what do I owe you? And Nervi said nothing, that it was such a pleasure to, to work with an architect like Seidler that uh, his, his advice was free, essentially. So it, it, it varied according to how um, 
how much the architect and and Nervi uh, saw uh, saw eye to eye or agreed on on how the structure and architecture should work. Thank you, Thomas. Any other questions? Yes, Raquel. Um, I was wondering how Nervi looked at himself. Did he look at himself as a designer, as an engineer, as an architect, as a builder? How did he view his, himself within his work? Mm. He he most frequently referred to himself as a as a builder. Um, uh, he uh, someone used the French word constructeur uh, for him once, and and he said that he liked that as much as anything. Uh, that that he wanted to be thought of as someone who actually built uh, the the work even more than as an engineer. He he thought I think that there was something more noble about actually building the, the structures than, than merely designing them. Thank you, Thomas. Any other questions? I have a question, Thomas. In your research, did you come across anything in terms of how he um, negotiated the, the relationship between manpower and materials and how that changed throughout the 20th century? in terms of having access to a great number of, of cheap labor. And then when he came to North America, for example, that sort of gets turned on its head. How did, did you see anything in terms of how he reacted to that, uh, uh, those issues? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, the you know, 1940s and early 50s Italy, there was a tremendous employment crisis. And you know, most of the unemployed were migrants from the South who uh, were not uh, often as skilled or as educated as, uh, as those in the, in the North. Um, and Nervi you know, saw that as a, as a potential resource, uh, but he also you know, saw it as a, as a, 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 a social good, right? That, that this was employment for uh, people who otherwise, otherwise couldn't work. And his process was very much based on the economics of you know this labor intensive process um, those you know the palazzetto even the palazzetto in 1957 was basically built by hand right hand uh, hand labor what's interesting is that when he has this later sort of celebrity engineer phase um, the cathedral in san francisco uh, he proposes exactly the same technique but labor in California is much more expensive. For, for one thing, there are unions right? um, that, that mean that the, the process doesn't work economically. And at one point, the cost problems are so great that Nervi even suggests that all of the prefabricated pans would have to be made in Italy and actually shipped to San Francisco right, to, um, to, to, to handle the, the labor costs. Um, ultimately, they are all uh, handmade in San Francisco, um, but there's there's a good reason I think why Nervi's technique was very specific to Italy and also very specific to 1950s, early 1960s Italy. Right, it doesn't translate into uh, a, a, a country with expensive labor like uh, like in uh, in North America, um, and it also doesn't translate into uh, countries that that have uh, affordable steel, right? It, it's still it's still uh, relating to the fact that that it was easier uh, to get to get the materials for concrete uh, regionally than it was for for any other material. So that that Carlo is actually a really great uh, question. It goes right to the heart of why Nervi's uh, buildings were so Italian uh, in a way. Hello. Yes, I'm just going to look at the chat, and I think we have a couple of questions. A lot of people are just congratulating you on a great lecture, Thomas. So I'm just uh, and here. That's nice to hear. Thank you. So we have one from Nicolas Marie who asks, 
who do you think would be Nervi's heirs, I guess, today? Uh, more broadly, what is his, his heritage in our contemporary constructive culture? Ah, uh, right. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that any uh, architect, any designer who is interested in, in taking the structural form and the constructive process seriously as, as inspiration for the, the aesthetics of a, of a building is in some ways uh, an heir of, of Nervi. Um, I, you know, having worked in Foster's office, you know, I, I can tell you that, that we looked at Nervi's structures all the time. Um, we didn't necessarily go out and build uh, concrete shells but we were very interested in the way that the engineering sort of spoke uh, as aesthetically. And I think that, you know, other um, uh, architects, Renzo Piano, for instance, is a very obvious example of someone who, even though he's, he's worked in a different era and therefore had access to a very different palette of materials, I think that sensibility of taking the fabrication process seriously alongside the, uh, the structural process is, is definitely there. Um, the one, the one person I get asked about all the time is Santiago Calatrava, uh, who uh, does buildings that I think, uh, at a, at first glance, maybe a, a look like uh, Nervi's buildings with structural ribs and uh, these these very expressive forms. But Nervi, uh, interestingly, was very, very dismissive of what he saw as structural gymnastics. In other words, sort of showing off. Um, he uh, took to task, for example, Jorn Utzen and Ero Saarinen in, in published criticism where he said, you know, you can be too expressive, right? You can let the building sort of get away from the, the, the structural principles that they start with. Um, and I imagine he would have thought of Calatrava as in Saarinen's uh, kind of vein, right? More an air of <clears throat> Saarinen than of, than of Nervi. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm a, I like Saarinen and there's the occasional Calatrava building that uh, I, I find very compelling. But I think that there's a, um, a rigor and a logic to, to Nervi's work that, is, um, that isn't present so, a, a lot of times in, in the more, um, more florid, more expressive work of, of someone like Calatrava. Thank you, Thomas. We have another question, and this one relates again to contemporary culture and uh, the value of Nervi, Nervi's work. It's, uh, I think it's Franz Van Latem who asks this question. Uh, what is the value of Nervi's work considering that science and technology are constantly being questioned, specifically in an era where ecological imperatives are so important? Mm. Yeah, that, that's an important point. Um, you know, Nervi is designing in an era where nobody is, is really thinking about um, carbon footprints or, or energy consumption. Um, there are buildings where you can see that he sees environmental response as part of the overall logic of the building. There's a very lovely, although unfortunately somewhat uh, ruined a pavilion in Turin that he did for the 1961 uh, Italian exposition there, um, where he uh, developed a system of solar louvers for the, the uh, glass curtain wall that surrounds it that shows that he was conscious of, you know, some of the principles that today we, we think are, are particularly important. I think that's, that's not to say that Nervi was designing in a way that was conscientiously ecological or, or, or sustainable. And if, if I'm understanding the question right, I think there's also um, uh, uh, maybe a skepticism in there about the, the celebration of science, the celebration of technology that, that Nervi's buildings imply. And, and I think that's true, that it was a more optimistic era. It was the era of you know, the, 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 the space race and the polio vaccine, and uh, people were much less skeptical of science and technology than, than I think they are today. In some ways, I think that makes Nervi's work even more important. That um, you know the, the 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 different maybe cultural attitudes that, that went into them. Uh, I think that's important to to preserve, and of course the fact that the you know most of these structures, uh, with the exception of the hangars, most of these structures are still there, 
there's still, you know, what we found in the, the preservation campaigns is that they are uh, usable, they are adaptable, and um, you know they uh, they they can can still make a contribution. Uh, so they're worth saving, I think, as um, artifacts from that era, uh, and maybe hopeful artifacts, right? Maybe they're they're a way of being optimistic uh, about the past and the future. Um, but I also think that they are very adaptable, uh, and they've proven even 60, 70, 80 years almost now, uh, that they can be uh, nurtured and maintained uh, and have a very, very long, uh, long life, long life and, and maybe even a revitalized life. Thank you, Thomas. I just wanted to let you know that uh, Elizabeth and Ervi was on uh, online as well and uh, appreciated your ah. lecture. So I just wanted <laughs> you, you to take note of that. Um, Good, thank you. Maybe one last uh, question from John Denbor. Uh, ah. I'm, struck, I'm struck by Nervi designing in an area, era of scarcity. Currently, because of the rapid rise in steel prices due to COVID, we've been pushed into designing building with precast concrete. Do you think Nervi would have arrived at his expressive design without the scarcity that he had to design around? Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's a great question. And uh, John, hi, it's, it's good, to, good to quote unquote see you again. Um, I suspect probably not. I think that, um, you know, in the, in the words of Charles and Ray Eames, constraint creates good design. Um, and the fact that he had, he was under these incredible pressures Right. I mean, imagine, you know, being told to build a 120 foot boat hull without electricity or cranes, whatever you end up doing is, is going to be incredibly well thought through. And I, I think that the, the, the pressures that he was under, um, you know, a lot of us would have given up, but in his case, I think it really distilled his ideas, right? It honed them, it, it, it sharpened them. Um, and I, I, I don't think he would have come up with the rigorous processes that, uh, that he did if he hadn't been faced with these you know, incredible uh, uh, conditions. Obviously others were faced with them as well and didn't come up with you know, similarly ingenious or similarly beautiful uh, approaches. So um, you know, that, that, that agile mind has to be there as well. But I think it's absolutely the case that um, Th that the, that condition of scarcity uh, really forged an approach, and that approach, of course, created these these great forms. And I I I don't think that his later career would have been would have produced such beautiful work if he hadn't had this um, this set of experiences uh, in the pre and uh, pre war and, and war years that, that 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 convinced him of that. I just want to thank you again, Thomas. I really appreciate you giving the lecture tonight. And I think all the students that are here with us and everyone who was online really appreciate it. And um, thanks again. And I would just take, like to take a few moments before everybody gets up and leaves to pour vous rappeler uh, que demain matin à 9h, il y a la journée d'études uh, expérimentation et standardisation. I just informed everyone to be back here at nine o'clock tomorrow morning for our study day on Nervi. So thanks again, Thomas, really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for having me.